All right, Lauren Bellinger. Dr. Lauren Bellinger is a board certified pediatric dentist and a certified specialist in orofacial myology. After 15 years of practicing restorative pediatric dentistry and interceptive orthodontics, she experienced her own aha moment that changed <laughs> the focus of her personal and professional life forever. Inspired by her own children, Dr. La Lauren began a pilgrimage of deeper learning and understanding to be the change for her children and for all of the children that needed her help. Dr. Lauren recently founded Good to Grow Pediatric Dental Wellness. I love that name, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Airway Growth and Sleep Solutions and the Nurture Phrenectomy Center, creating an answer to her calling in unique pediatric practice model, solely focused on addressing the root causes of sub, sub optimal function growth and development. That's a lot of words. <laughs> and I'm still, I mean, I'm better from COVID, but sometimes it makes me want to cough. But anyways, um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about everything. Um, you know, our big topic was be the change. So thank you to Anne, who is our editor at Airway Circle. She has put some wonderful questions together. And also Dr. Lauren Bellinger, let us take some questions from the wonderful Endeavor group. They have some Q and A's. Uh, she sent those over to us also that we're going to be using. But if you guys have any questions, please uh, let us know on Facebook. I have my phone with, with me so I can read whoever's live on Facebook and also on Clubhouse or over here on Zoom. You guys can just put it right on the chat and we will read them to you. So thank you so yeah, much. Talk a little you. bit about doing a presentation versus just sort of talking in q and A. I, it happens to be that I have a um, real short presentation that I'm giving um, a collaborative cures. We don't, I mean, like if there's absolutely no questions, I could go into that. But I usually find that um, whenever we all get together, right, like this, sometimes I know I learn a little bit more sometimes in a group setting, just talking and sort of riffing it out. So however you guys wanna do it is great. Definitely. Would you like to share something? It's up to you. Not necessarily. I mean, um, unless everybody, I mean, so this this presentation is really what I would be giving at Collaborative Cures. I don't know how many people here are going to be there. So I'll be know. there. Everybody lift your hand up. Tell us on the so chat. I don't want to give it if everybody's going to see it again. Exactly. We'd have to be after. We have to bring you back after. Okay. Right. Yeah, so, um, yeah the, really what this is, it's going to be a short um I'm, I, I'm assuming most people know who uh, Bill Hang is, the orthodontist, right? So um, through our Endeavor group, we wanted to do a shorter presentation and really what the Endeavor group is, which is, um, you know, a year and a half ago uh, when COVID started and we all weren't in work, um, you know, it was interesting, Kevin Boyd, I'm sure you guys know who Dr. Kevin Boyd is. I think he's been, has he been on your? He has, he was on oh, my yeah, birthday. Right. He's on my birthday oh, gift. Well, no one, that's like the best birthday present ever. Mm -hmm. um, we actually both had the same thought simultaneously when we were sitting home, which was, you know, one of the silver linings with COVID was that it at least was getting people's attention about breathing. And, you know, a lot of the, um, co I mean, the general public might not have realized this, but a lot of the comorbidities, the people who get sicker with COVID happen to be a lot of the same comorbidities that go along with uh, sleep, uh, breathing issues like OSA. So um, it was really strange that we both, we, we called each other at the same time and we were having the same thought about, you know, this is really a chance for us to maybe get attention of um, uh, the public in a little bit of a different way because people are aware. So. Before you knew it, um, we sort of gathered a group of, um, to be honest, I mean, most of them are my mentors. The fact that we meet once uh, once a week and we've done so for almost 18 months now without missing a Monday wow, is wow. Um, sometimes uh, a dream come true. You know, I pinch myself because I can't believe, you know, when we've become friends, but like I said, most of these people have really impacted me uh, hugely professionally. Um, so fast forward, um, we are gonna be giving sort of, uh, I think there's six of us or seven of us giving 
quick 18 minute presentations based off of a um, woman who's an activist that Bill knows. Um, it'll be the first time I meet her, but apparently um, she did work. You guys are all probably too young on this to remember even Ronald Reagan and the Just Say No to Drugs campaign. But you know she does a lot of um, government advocacy and philanthropy. So she has a daughter who's in her early 20s who you know just was misdiagnosed and led down the wrong path before she saw Bill Hang and just has all these you know lifelong issues that we all know about when kids grow into adults with airway issues. So she's giving, um, I haven't heard it yet, but a very inspirational speech and then we're all kind of going after um, pretty quickly, right? And, and my task that was given to me by Bill Hang was to um, sort of talk in 18 minutes, which is not easy about um, my aha moment with my own children and then also how that left me to sort of realize that I was an airway patient too. Um, you know, a lot of times I think parents, when, when I see parents, um, you know, one of the ways that they start recognizing their child's potential for illness is because they start recognizing some of the signs that I might be asking about with their kids. My sort of aha moment for me personally, I sort of backed into it because it totally made sense for me for kids. And then the more I started learning and you know, sitting in, oh my gosh, I see Marilyn Lobo's name here. Marilyn Lobo and I did our residency together. Oh my gosh, how exciting. And we're separated by oceans. She's in Perth, Australia. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy she's here. <laughs> anyway, she's one of my besties. Um, yeah, so I sort of backed into it and it was sort of another aha moment for me. Like, oh, wait a minute, like, you know, my chronic headaches and sort of living in this, which I think a lot of us that are probably on this right now live in this highly sympathetic cortisol ridden state. You know, I don't know if it's a personality disorder of the kind <laughs> of, you know, I think it's partly our physiology and maybe partly our mentality. I don't know, but I started learning a lot about myself and, um, some pretty significant, um, things. I mean, I'll, you know, it's not about me, but you know, when I started scanning myself, I probably have one of the smallest airways and spaces you have ever seen. And we have, wow. I know often a lot and yeah, I'm a candidate myself for double jaw surgery. And I have some uh, wow. condylar resorption. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, and what's amazing for me about that is how some adults can compensate, um, a little bit better than others, but it's always gonna come and get you at the end. Like it's always knocking on the back door, right? Like you think you might be overcoming and compensating, but at some point your body and your physiology catches up with you. So that's been sort of how I learned about it. And I think it's interesting because when I speak as a pediatric dentist to a lot of general dentists, um, they're sort of learning about what you can do on the front end because they're bombarded with all these adults like me of how are you gonna unwind this, which, you know, I don't necessarily think it is rewindable. I think, you know, it's trying to find the best symptomatic relief to, you know, even double jaw surgery and myofunctional therapy, all the best modalities that you can do, the best is to catch it earlier, right? So you can help kids, you know, not grow into their disease, but grow out of it. So, um, right. Okay, so that's a little history of me. Perfect. We got 11 people on Facebook. We have a great crowd on Clubhouse and 13 people great. here. And it's going up over there because I just did some shares. That's why I was looking away for a second. Oh, great. No. We have so many amazing questions. Um, do you do orthotropics at all? I do. Ah. Yes. That's how I met Bill. Oh, ah, yes. all right. So what is the earliest age you've treated a child with orthotropics? That's a great question. So let me answer it indirectly like a politician. You know, for those of you who know about orthotropics, they're sort of the sweet spot, right? You want to usually be in the early-ish mixed dentition. Um, you can treat in the primary dentition. Um, but you know, you want to be in the early or mixed dentition when you have your front upper incisors because you want to flare those out. Okay. So that could be anywhere from six, seven to eight. What Bill and Hang and I have been talking about a lot and actually what 
myself and two other pediatric dentists, uh, Loria Nahadis and Carla Damon, who Loria is also a co-resident with Marilyn and I, and she met a really fantastic uh, airway pediatric dentist in uh, Texas. So the three of us have been meeting with Bill once a month as he's developing, guys, this is so exciting, hit a newer course and to treat, to talk about pre-orthotropics because we believe that if you start early enough, okay? And I have some cases and I can even show you guys some cases later if we have some time. Um, three, you know, I have a case in my um, presentation where I started with um, a little boy who's delayed, it's definitely delayed. He's just three. I put a, um, a hang type expander, which is sort of like a BioBlock stage one on his D's, on his first primary molars because he was ready and his parents were ready. So, you know, the premise really is, is that orthotropics, you know, surgery without a knife to get those jaws forward. But if you capture that growth early, which is really that three to five, can get that, you may not need orthotropics. And one of the things that Bill, who was trained by John Yu and all of us little of his disciples will all agree is that orthotropics is very difficult. Okay, my daughter went through orthotropics twice. She started with Barry Raphael and I took over the second half. Those were my first cases. I know we've all treated our own kids and it's, it's probably the hardest patients we have for so many reasons. Um, and I have about, you know, I have over a dozen other ones that I've done, which doesn't sound like a lot, but these cases just drag on forever and they are highly compliance uh, driven. Um, if we can affect change and correct that growth um, and get them on the right track and then support it with good function and breathing, then we don't need orthotropics. So that's my answer to that. So, you know, the kids that you treat in orthotropics have to be, it's not so much age, but you need, um, you know, good D and E, you know, roots in there. You want your uh, laterals and incisors in there. And again, so that can be anywhere from six to you know, for a late developer, nine. But really the thing to think about is, is when Bill comes with this course, if we can, and that's what I really like talking about, let's get really brave and get in there at three and, um, you know, get going and get that growth right so we might not need it. Sorry, I muted myself, I forgot about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's a two-part question. How do you incorporate myofunctional, myofunctional therapy into your practice? And what results have you seen with the addition of myofunctional therapy in combination with orthotropics? Great question. Okay. So I believe that none of this is really possible. You can be the best dentist, the best orthodontist, the best, whatever it is, and you know, use your appliances brilliantly and get the structure completely right. If you don't support it with being able to establish nasal breathing, have a proper tongue position with your lips closed, it's all, the kids are gonna grow out of it. So um, you, you, they have to be both. Um, it's crucial, not just for orthotropics, for anything that we're doing, because I know I'm talking to, uh, you know, the, uh, the what, am I, what is that thing? You know, I'm talking to the group that already knows this, you know, duh, the tongue, is the scaffold for everything else, but it's true. We, these, I mean, we, I've seen kids, you know, I've done the best work I can. They kind of fall off their myofunctionals or they're not treating their allergies. This is usually an underlying thing that we come back to is that if your allergies are not diagnosed and treated really sometimes like paid attention to and dealt with on a daily basis, the mouth breathing is gonna come back and these kids start, start, start like growing out of what you just did. So you have to have the myofunctional. The way that I've incorporated it, and it's really important for me to say, um, one of the things I've come to is that like, I am not a believer in like, this person's appliance per is perfect. This like system is perfect. Like I did drink the Kool-Aid. I've made so many mistakes. So I try to share mistakes with people so they don't. So for instance, you know, I'm a certified um, myobrace provider. I love myobrace. When I first started doing it six years ago, I thought it cured everything. I drank that Kool-Aid, right? Now, you know, you make some mistakes. You know, I, the way I describe Myobrace or Healthy Start or any of those, which I think are all very effective is 
is it's a tool in your toolbox. And one of the things that I got out of saying was, you know, I used to use myobrace, say, okay, well, if we do this early enough, you know, their tagline is straight teeth without braces. All right. What I've learned from experience and just also my mentors and just doing hundreds and hundreds of cases is, is that even if you do an infant phrenectomy, these kids are already born, you know, five months behind because their, their facial respiratory complex started developing in utero. So yes, you might release the tongue. Yes, you might get optimal breastfeeding, but their structures are too small. And most more times than not, the function isn't enough to catch up to where they should be. So myofunctional therapy, we just say for patients, just so they get it is, and I'll tell you how we do it in my office. When you're seeing us for myobrace, or for myofunctional therapy, which we also do separately, it's to treat the muscles. If we're doing the ortho, it's to treat the bones. So that they're, and they're complementary, and I think you need both. So I started down the myobrace path because I have an incredible team of women that work with me who are so smart and motivated and just like incredible learners. Um, they got smarter than me really quickly. Um, you know, one of my assistants would come up to me and be like, well, if I do this, am I getting the longitudinal fibers? Or the and I was like, what are you talking? You know, like I knew, but she was coming, you know, because I'm technically overseeing her. And I was just like, all right. So I decided to get my certification in oral facial myology because I just wanted the bigger picture. And I think what's great about that is then that allows you a little bit to get out of the box of, you know, just what myobrace is telling you or just what or, you know, that you can start to sort of pick and choose and start to realize that, you know, this child might do well with the trainer, this child might do really well with some exercises without the trainer, it just gives you a little bit more flexibility. So every person, every treatment plan that we do, the way we incorporate it is, is I incorporate it as part of the fee or what we're doing in our um, program. I don't anymore. I used to say, if you do this, like for myofunctional therapy, then you might get out of this. Mm -hmm. I learned that that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's an inclusive fee um, because I feel like, even though I'm a dentist first, not a myofunctional therapist. So it's, you know, I don't feel like they're getting two for one. They're getting something additional. And yeah. there's always going to be cases that just like any other specialty where they might be better with a oral myofunctional therapist, it's not in a dental office, mm -hmm. right? Like we can get through most things, but you know, we're always going to get stuck and may need to look to another professional. Um, also what I found is I tell them it's all on you. It's compliance based. We can offer it. Like I know I can get you there with structure, but it's really up to the parents and kids to get themselves there with, um, it's a huge, it's a huge commitment. All of us know that. So it's offered at every part of what we do. I love it. Mm -hmm. Um, can you take us through the process that you use to determine which appliance is appropriate for each, which child? Thank oh. you. Anne. Anne wrote these questions and it's okay. fabulous. Great question. All right. So let me go back to what I just said first. So a lot of people will ask what appliance did you use, right? Like, what do you like? So, um, what I'm fortunate about when I came into this, I had a very heavy ortho background, um, not necessarily from residency, but the first um, first 15 years that um, I was working, I worked in a practice. It was actually my family practice uh, where pediatric dentists, they had been doing early phase one, phase two orthodontics for 35 years. So I had to learn up quick. So I had a lot of bracketing and understanding. Okay. And I'm saying that because it's not necessarily, do you use a bio block? Do you use a Schwartz? Do you use a, you know, all the different things? It's understanding what your goals are, right? Um, and the limitations of just expansion. So, or not. So I have used everything. My favorite is usually is the hang expanser or expander, which is really like a bio block stage one. It looks like a regular acrylic born. What makes it a little bit different why it's a hang is because it has clasps on it that allows kids to eat with it. So it's removable, but they can eat. You know, I tell them they have to wear it 23 hours and 55 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are some kids and I've been doing a lot more experimentation and asking 
um, and I sort of got this from Kevin Boyd about, you know, he the way he asked it is, is he'll ask the mom, you know, is your child a rule follower or not? Um, you probably talked about that, right? To decide whether they're going to have a removable or a fix. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of cool is, is that you can have that same expander that I just talked about that's a removable, ask for like a little bit of a Puzo acrylic. I mean, sometimes you need more Puzo acrylic to open up the vertical, but I'm just talking about like a little bit. So if you give a kid a chance to see how they're doing and they're not working, you can submit it in. So, um, you know, it doesn't become an issue. The last, um, actually the last six months, I've been playing with a couple other more cemented appliances, you know, the ones that look like, um, you know, a traditional expander with the metal key and um, then they're acrylic form, they look a little bit different. So really what I'm looking for is I know that every child can handle an expander, okay? I can, like I said, we have some time, we can do it. Kids are like dogs and they smell fear, right? If you have the confidence to believe that they can get through this, I guarantee you they'll get through this. So you have to convince yourself and then you have to convince the parents. So, you know, the, the children aren't feeding off of them. But, you know, I treat kids three to teenagers. I wish I didn't have to treat teenagers because they're the, to me, they're like, well, they're like treating an adult patient, right? So if, if I could just limit my practice to, you know, up to eight, I would, I really would. But the problem is, is there's no one else that's gonna, you know, when these older kids walk in, who else is gonna help them without hurting them? So um, I look at, I love that. yeah. I love yeah. you said that, help them without hurting them. I'm gonna write that down. Okay, yeah. So, oh. you know, I'm always like, okay, I'll do it. But they're hard. You guys who treat adults, it's so hard. It's really hard. Um, so yeah, um, really, I mean, really any expander will work. Um, you know, sometimes you need to open the bite up. Um, I, so I use Hang's lab a lot. I like that. I, I, his appliances are expensive, but they're excellent. And if you get in contact with him, he will also sort of mentor you through it. Like if you have questions, you know, he'll kind of help you through it. Um, I've been using a little bit of Dynaflex's lab. I really like those. I mean, I've done a little bit of everything. The goal that you have to understand is what are you trying to do? Do you want to get transverse expansion? And really, you can get that in many ways. A quote that I love, again, from Dr. Hang is, is though you can't always expand your way out of an AP problem. You can't treat an AP problem with a transverse solution. So a lot of these kids, even ones that you, you know, don't, that we call class three, but they're really maxillary hypoplastic, a lot of kids need, um, reverse pulse headgear as well. So especially when you're doing that early, it's great. So I, I hope that answered your question, but it can be fixed. It can be removable. Um, you know, I know a lot of people get, you know, well, do I do a half a turn every day or a quarter turn? You know, look, it depends on the, okay, I'm going to just boil it down here. I mean, really, you can't, semi, you're safe with semi rapid. All right. So in general, how I started is with the appliances that I get, the screws for every turn, it's like a quarter turn, it's a quarter of a millimeter. So four turns are a millimeter. So I start most kids off with um, a quarter turn, which is a quarter of a millimeter every other day. So that means by four turns, it's a millimeter. Okay. And that usually goes along really, really well. I do tell um, kids and parents, especially older ones, to listen to their body if they just feel because ideally every child going through structural correction should be having some sort of body support work, right? Because every time you're changing something, even though you're changing it for the good, everything else is falling off, okay? But not everybody gets to do that. So I do believe that sometimes we do create some craniofacial stress, uh, cranial uh, fascial stresses. Mm -hmm. Of course we do. You know, sometimes after you get the best massage in the world, you feel beat up the next day, right? So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times it feels like you're taking two steps back to get forward, but getting these kids out of distress as early as possible is important. So that means that we're doing a, a, um, millimeter, what, like maybe every like week and a half. Mm -hmm. So, but sometimes I'll tell them to slow it down to like twice a week. Um, I never do it faster than that. If I suspect that a kid is taking it out, which you can tell, cause it gets ahead of itself, you know, and 
even though they're saying, no, no, I'm doing everything right. And you just know, sometimes I'll go down to once a week, but mm -hmm. in general it's, um, so if we did one, two, if you're viewing like two and then three turns. Yeah. So it's like a millimeter and a half every two weeks. And you yeah, do that with then, all the expanders pretty much. It doesn't matter which expander that's because, the rate. Yeah, I mean, right. They all might have a little bit of different, different things, but, turn, just, but... I, I, you know, I, I hate to say this, and we talk about this in the endeavor because we don't want to be flippant or feel dangerous, right? Because it, but when you're working with kids this young, you really can't hurt them. Now, I'm not saying to be out, you know, go out and be a cowboy. You need to know what you're doing, but you can't. They're like malleable, and their body wants to get better. So, um, oh, I love it. Yeah, it seems to work. And I do do lower expansion. You have to do lower expansion, and you know, really, what the lower expansion is is the uprighting. But it's amazing, like you sometimes just can't believe you, you have to do it. So usually with the little kids, because they're so little and they're already orally crowded, putting all the stuff in their mouth. Um, you know, I usually go through, especially with these little kids, um, one full round of an upper expander. And these expanders are so small that like sometimes you only have five millimeters in the first screw. So they're going to get through that really fast. They get used to it. And then the second expander, we may add in a lower one. You know, it's just because you can catch up with the lower. You don't need with these lower kids to like throw everything at them in the kitchen sink because, you know, the upper one needs to stay in for a few months after we get them there anyway. So you can catch up on the bottom. But doing lower expansion is very important. I do mostly fixed on the lower. Um, for some older kids, you know, I'm experimenting a little bit more with the removable Schwartz for very um, compliant kids or kids where I need to open the bite. And that's working out really well, so, really well. <laughs> Fantastic. We have two questions. Uh, Dr. Tuesday says, up to what age can one use a fixed expander? Boy, that's a great question. And I, you know, I don't know. Um, one of the things that's on my bucket list of learning is, um, you know, TAD supported maxillary expansion where you're getting less tipping and more skeletal. Um, you know, the only reason why I don't do that yet is because as you guys know, we're all CE junkies and there's only so, <laughs> there's only yeah. so many courses and things you can learn while still trying to work and keep the lights on. Right. Yes. So, and because I like to focus on lower kids, you know, I do do expansion because that particular tool is not in my toolbox. Um, I do use expanders and teenagers, like the ones that I'm talking about. I do tend to go a little bit slower with the rate. Like usually I'll start them at like um, twice a week because I want to try to avoid tipping, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit more. Um, and I'm getting, look, I'm getting very good arch forms because, you know, I don't know if I'm getting that sort of, uh, nasal cavity expansion that I'm getting in the young kids, or I get with TAD supported implants, mm -hmm. but I'm definitely getting more oral volume, you know, mm -hmm. um, I did expansion on myself um, under, you know, again, like I know we all do too much stuff with ourselves, but Hang was watching me and I was really, really narrow. Um, I was under 30 intermaxillary width and just with expansion. Yeah, so you guys, that's um, a whole other story. you don't want to see my nightmare. I'm at 31. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I know it's like instead of like talking about like our height or anything, we're talking about it's like, what's your molar to molar? I know. <laughs> I know things that like our standards of attractiveness and beauty have like it's like all different, right? Like, do you have spaces? Because spaces are like in, right? <laughs> so, um, um, yeah. So, but I got to about thirty-seven, okay, wow. and without a lot of tooth tipping. Now it's funny since I took it out because it really, you know, we wanted to see if it would kind of get me out of surgery, and it wasn't. And I'll tell you, I've relapsed a little bit because you know at night I don't breathe well through my, you know, mm -hmm. it was more an experience. It was great for me to wear because I got used to it. And I used to say I had a top and a bottom. And when the kids would look at me, it would be really fun to say, hey, I have it in too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I do think you can get some expansion. You know, I, I, I'm i not like Dr. Yoon where, you know, they're doing all the studies about what, or, or Mariana Evans, where they're really looking at the, you know, following up the uh, sutural expansion in the nose. My guess is, is that you get better expansion mm -hmm. if you're doing TAD supported. But again, I've used them in teenagers because I figure 
again, because I, you know, I feel confident enough that I'm not going to tip the teeth or hurt them that um, I'm helping them. You know, as long as you feel in your wheelhouse that you can do something that's beneficial and not hurt them, I think it's worth going for it. Um, we have a question on Facebook by Emily and she says, is flaring out, this is from whenever you said in the beginning, is flaring out of the incisors the best way to unlock the mandible? Yeah, so when you're doing orthotropics, for those of you who have done or seen orthotropics, it is the scariest thing you have ever seen. Yes, and you, you know, you're taking up some of your follow-up films and you, you know, those teeth are just out there and the, you know, the roots just look like they're out here. And that's why case selection is so important. Not so much that you're going to do something wrong, but that if your patient jumps ship in the middle of your treatment and goes to the orthodontist down the street, they're going to see that and just totally freak out. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah, so right. We know that the maxilla really is the arch that is causing us problems, right? Like everything else is dependent on that maxilla. And the way I explain it to patients is like, if you have a box, like a shoe box, right? That top that goes on it is going to constrict the lowest, the lower part. So, you know, when you're inside of it, that deep bite is like this, even if you open it up, right? You're still constricted. So by flaring these out and opening the bite, and working on tongue posture, you can get that lower mandible to come in. That's something, you know, that's not just a principle in orthotropics. What's really cool is, is that if you learn a little bit about orthotropics, you can do a little bit of what's called orthotropic light. And, you know, I kind of made that up and that you can still use an expanser or some sort of advancing appliance. Okay, you're not going crazy where you're gonna do the positioner, but when you're working up these cases, what we all start to see is that these canines are on the wrong path and they're going to be impacted or start coming in ectopically. So flaring out those incisors, opening up the bite while getting your transverse allows that lower jaw to come in, but then it really starts because when your canines are impacted, it's not really a transverse problem. It's a AP maybe. problem, right? It's almost like the incisors haven't gotten the message. It's like, they are in the right place. Your maxilla is not. Not. <laughs> I love that. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's like you have to figure out how you're going to bring. And if, you know, and when I'm talking about the maxilla, the pre maxilla, how are you going to bring those sort of four teeth in front? So that's what I do a lot, even if I'm not doing orthotropics. I do a little flaring expansion, bring them out. And then I consolidate those four teeth with like utility arch um, uh, mechanics with some bra braces. And then that's, that's like, that to me is finishing the case when, you know, you get all four of those teeth in alignment, open the bite, the jaw can come forward, you're doing your myofunctional therapy, and then you have them maybe in a Holly retainer that could be for years because they're not going to get their canines until they're 12. I finish with a lot of extra space where those C and H are a mm -hmm. lot. So it almost looks like you could fit another tooth between the lateral incisors and the primary canines, but then over the year, they just right into place. And I feel like if from a dental goal for me, like we have airway goals and function goals, which are incredibly important from like the plain old dentist in me, the tooth thing, if I'm like, all right, if I can make space for those canines and get them in, that's a huge accomplishment. So um, that's another part of starting early. So you're right. So flaring those teeth are also helping to consolidate them forward. So those canines can come in. Beautiful. Uh, Doris um, is saying, are you expanding the bone when working slowly? At what age do you get tipping rather than skeletal expansion? Yeah, I have to be honest. I, I don't know exactly. And I think that, I think that, um, you know, the, our, our histology, you know, our histology, we know that, you know, growth is pretty much done by 12, right? But I think all of our histology is a little bit different. You know, um, like R Dr. Ramirez believes, you know, I, for those of you who heard him speak, and I love him, He's you know, great. he starts talking about, I have a 71 year old baby, you know, he has the greatest accent <laughs> in the face. So I treat my 71 year old baby with expansion. <laughs> I mean, he, and he's also, a, what does he have like his degree in embryology? Like he really understands bone. 
right? Mm -hmm. And he believes and you know, has great slides and research. He's done the research that says that, yes, you can get that, right? And then there's some research that says, no, you can't, right? No, you can't, you can just get tipping. And I think because this is, I mean, this isn't new. I mean, the art we, you know, people have been doing expansion, you know, for centuries, you know, the last, you know, in the 1800s, there's literature about this, but in terms of asking for validated evidence support, it's not all there yet, you know? So I hate to tell you that it, it's, it's a lot of the careful experimentation and talking to other providers and seeing what you're getting. But I do, I have found that by using um, an acrylic born um, expander, so you have some acrylic in the palette, right? Um, that I'm sure I'm not getting just skeletal expansion. I'm sure I'm getting some tipping, but when I, you know, do my follow-up records, I mean, the teeth are not, you know, it looks- Exactly. It looks, it looks good. It's better. Yes. It's better. I've also learned to temper myself guys with as dentists, we are so, and oh my gosh, it's even worse than Dennis. <laughs> we are so focused on details and measurements and stuff. You know, I think that once you, we start giving ourselves a break about, can we make our patients better and not perfect? There is no perfect in human beings, you know, and whatever we're doing, we're also not living in a hermetically sealed bubble where there's not environmental stress, you know, all the other stressors what can we do to help make these patients even better? And then, then you start feeling a little less frustrated with just the barriers of life, yeah. right? So it's always worth trying. That is so true. Um, let's see another question that I have here. You already talked about fixed and removable. Um, how is your nurture phrenectomy center set up and what disciplines do you work with? Are they on site? Great question. So when I set up this practice uh, about a year and a half ago, right during COVID, because I figured, why not? Wow. <laughs> you know, why not? Why not just go Why not start a new business? I'll never That's forget my husband, my husband, who's a dentist too. You know, we're all out of work, right? And we were taking a walk. Oh, and it was in a car, front end car accident on March 9th. Mm -hmm. And I, we were taking a walk because, you know, I was kind of rehabbing. And I said, wow. I don't think I'm going to go back to my own job, my old job. And he's like, what? <laughs> Boy, what? I'm like, yeah, I don't think I can do it. I think this is the time. You know, like you have like a near death experience. You're like, yeah, uh -huh. I'm done. Right. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's been a little, it's been the best thing I've done, but it's been a little bumpy, just like how everything has been from COVID, not because of patients, just because of everything yes. that we're dealing with. So, one of the things that I did is I set up the reason why I have two practices is because I want to be able to take Medicaid for phrenectomies for infant phrenectomies. Mm. So as a pediatric dentist, I feel like um, it's very important to, uh, you know, provide to the underserved populations, dropping um, Medicaid or what we have mass health from my general patient population was very difficult for me because I feel like, you know, that's as a pediatric dentist, you definitely have a um, sort of a, a community health mind, mm -hmm. but I, get, I stopped doing restorative dentistry completely. And, um, but I wanted to make sure for a newborn infant, you know, a lot of times these babies aren't even on anybody's insurance that we could open it up. So I have two PCs that way, one is completely fee for service. And then the other one were accepting insurance. So this is what's really cool. One of my, you remember I told you guys, I have like the best team ever. Yes. So my assistant, believe it or not, um, and I say that because I think assistants a lot of times are really undervalued. Um, there, I just, you know, one of the things I've learned is not all women have the opportunity to take the course in life that we had, you know, to get, you know, not everybody is, you know, has the opportunity to go to college and then grad school after. Not everybody has the opportunity to go to hygiene school. It does not mean that you don't have a brilliant mind. If somebody gives you the opportunity or the curiosity about it. So I just have young women who are just incredibly brilliant. One of them um, decided she got just really turned on by what I was doing. She went and got her certification. She's a CLC. And when she went to do her um, certification, she was the only 
person sitting in our class that wasn't an RDH or have her master's or wasn't a physician's assistant or an ICU nurse and she nailed it. So, and you know, and she will work one day to become an IBCLC, but to be an IBCLC, that is like a upper level master's degree, right? Yeah. So the way we work it is, so she is always on site with me and it has changed everything because she is able to do all the workup, all the intake, all the nurturing that I like to do, but I don't have time to do while I'm trying to run a business. She'll get them all worked up, all the assessment, look at the breastfeeding, do the weighted feeds, all that stuff. I come in, we do our diagnosis when we do the treatment. Um, you know, then she follows up with them right after she's able to help them with positioning. We see them the day after we see them five days after that, then we see them seven days after that and another seven days. And then she also makes sure that she's collaborating with the other IB, you know, whoever else they're working with, she helps get them into body work. So she's coordinating all that. It is a gift. I would really recommend any of you who are doing infant phrenectomies. Um, you know, I don't know what the laws are like Maryland and in Australia, but you can, you can get your CLC. You do not have to be, you don't have to have an RDH or a master's degree or a doctor degree. And if you have a team member who is a mom and might've gone through any of this and has an interest, it just changes everything. Um, she also is now almost finished with, she's also getting her, um, it's a light, uh, massage therapy license. Okay. So then she's going to, then she's doing some mentoring and some other work with some craniofacial massage. So she's working to do that to help also with some body work with the baby. And yes, having it on site is like a dream come true. That's amazing. Dr. Martha, Dr. Martha Cortez is listening on Clubhouse. Ah! <laughs> she's asking, we haven't met, but I, you know, I know about her, right? Yeah, she's fantastic. What is a CLT certification? That's a certified lactation consultant, right? Yes. So Perfect. when you see when you certified? see lactation consultants, there there's like LCs, okay? And I'm sure they're very good, but for low, you know, those who are like picky about certifications, um, being a lactation consultant is more, you know, it's something more that you can um, I don't want to say weekend warrior. I don't mean it like that, but I think there's less of a licensing, there's less of a certification, okay? A CLC is one step up. It's a certified lactation exactly. consultant. Um, and, you know, they, they have to have a certain amount of hours in the classroom and um, cases to get your mm -hmm. certification. Um, and then an IBCLC, I mean, it's that plus, I, I mean, IBCLCs are usually, they've been ICU nurses. Uh, you know, they've been, mm -hmm. I mean, they are incredible. And, like I, there's not enough IBCLCs, just like there's not enough myofunctional therapists to serve all of us. There's just not. So how can we sort of like make a spider web of team members, right? So a CLC, she has lots of, she has two IBCLC mentors that are in the area who, and their group work with a whole bunch of CLCs that she can call if she's stuck mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean? So it's, it's a great collaboration. So it's a certified lactation consultant. And if anyone is interested in it, I mean, the way Taryn brought it to me is she just searched, how do I become a certified exactly. lactation consultant? And, you know, in each state, you know, they're running like some certification courses, but hey, look, she nailed it. She said she was so intimidated at first and then she That's nailed it. That's amazing. I want to so bad to get my IBCLC. And then I heard that in Georgia, you have to retake your boards every 10 years. Yeah, I mean, listen, what? IBCLC is no joke. <laughs> retake your boards? Are you kidding me? Nobody else has no, to retake like, no. their boards. So, but, so do a CLC course. Yeah. I well, mean, I know we I've all want done. that IBCLC. I mean, that's just like, right. It's just amazing. But you can do so, so much. much. I mean, oh my gosh. Her knowledge, like what she's learned about, oh, just, you know, things that, she can just help them in different ways that, exactly. you know, that I'm interested in, but as a dentist or a hygienist, you may not have, to, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's made all the difference in the world. Oh, there you go. All MDS have to retake boards every 10 years. I had no idea. That's insane. All what? MDS. What are MDS, Dr. Martha? 
all MDs, maybe she means MDs. All MDs have to retake their well, board. Well, I know years. like Marilyn and I, she'll be, we have to, oh, again, no, it must oh, be. Yeah, she's saying we yes. have to retake, we have to retake our written boards, our pediatric <laughs> written boards every 10 years. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's something. All right, Sarah Beach. Hello, Sarah Beach. She's on Facebook Live and she's saying, love, love, love your approach to practicing team dentistry. Thank you for highlighting the importance of the team supporting what you do. It really changes everything. Okay, yeah. Let me just, there is absolutely no way that I could have any, that, I mean, for me, for my day, that I could even come into work and be happy and function if I didn't have the team. But the results that we're getting is from the team. It is absolutely, and, and I look at them as my partners because we are partners in crime. We are each putting our certain little spin on it. Somebody asked before, what kind of results do we get from myofunctional therapy? So I spoke about Taryn. Dakota is just such a mastermind and she really runs all my myofunctional therapy. You know, we all do have our certification from MRC is, you know, myofunctional, whatever, you know, it's a myofunctional certified myofunctional therapist, whatever. I mean, people get yeah. all, things yeah. up, but she really knows what she's doing. She's the one that shit, look, she closes open bites for me. She's the one that, I mean, her work is incredible and she is sort of running her own thing. Um, Taryn's running her own thing. And at the same time, they're sort of jumping in to help me. Um, you know, they have a lot of orthodontic training because training they followed me from my other practice. But the, the only way that we are able to function and provide the kind of care we do is because of the team. I Without love a doubt. I love it. We have one last question before okay. we, we um, call the night. And by the way, if you guys want to rewatch this, we will have it available on our airwaycircle.com uh, page. Uh, so for members, if you are a paying member, you have access to all of our recorded clubhouses and all of our uh, recorded Facebook lives. The first Facebook lives that we had done the first six months, they're open to the public. And now we just started keeping it for our members whenever we started our membership. So join us. Also, we just put a video out there today from Marielle Bussi, the SLP from Brazil, who's going to be doing an incredible class on sleep disorder breathing and myofunctional therapy. How do we treat as myofunctional therapists patients who have sleep issues? What are you looking at? What are you doing? What kind of exercise are you, are you choosing? Uh, it's going to be very in-depth. And everybody always asks me, what are the exercises they do in Brazil? Because those work. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you're going to find Brazil, out. Brazil is way ahead of the curve, always, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so you're going to find out October 2nd, join us. We're so excited to have her. Uh, so our last question, uh, and then also I would like to, to, for you to tell us a little bit of how, how we can find you if it, you know, yeah, yeah. you're going to be patient, but how can we best support parents pre and post phrenectomy? That's a great question. So I think it's being, okay, nurturing, loving them. Okay. But, um, I think you know, some of the mistakes that I have made is, um, you know, because we're really nice people in general, and, you know, we want to always make everything easy and not hurt. But I think being very honest about expectations that um, for me, and I tell patients this too, like, you could come walk off the street in my practice, and because they were referred by some, you know, so and so, and they say, you need to, I need a release. In my practice, that's not going to happen unless we're approaching it comprehensively. Like if you just want to release, you got to, so you got to explain why, right? So you really do have to explain in a language that they can understand that, you know, the frenum is just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot of other things that we have to work out for. I mean, there's kids, there's babies that they need body work before. And why can't we just do this? Because it, does, it doesn't work. So really sticking to what you know inside is sort of the, and not getting talked in to, um, because we know parents want these quick relief. And we know those of us who are parents, what a pain in the butt it is to take time off of work and school for appointments and how busy life is after and doing all these other exercises. So especially like for an older kid, I will say, this might not be a good time. You, okay, you just had an infant and 
your child just started third grade and you're going to have this whole program where you have to do this six times, you know, it's not the right time. You know, if you're, let's find a time that's really going to work where you're going to focus on this. So setting expectations, um, making sure that like before when you do do pre-functional myofunction like pre-release myofunctional therapy or stretches before that you give it to them as pre-homework and check up on them like have them come into your office and say show me what you're doing so you know that they're doing it right or you know the kids are doing the myo it's not just you guys know it's not just tongue clicks you have to be doing it right um, so really spending time on the front end, getting prepared and not letting yourself get sort of heart tugged into just doing it because you want to help. You are not helping as much as you could if you're not sticking to their guns. And then that means that post-operative care, um, you've already prepared them. It's about going in prepared. So yes, within the first 10 days of life, if a child is struggling, you need to get in there and do it right away. Um, and help hold their hand to support them. You know, after that, if a baby isn't in distress, you know, like around three or four months when the milk, um, when the hormones stop pumping and it's more of a supply and demand, these babies really do benefit from some body work before and the baby is not in distress. So we have time. Then that goes to older kids. We might see kids, you know, they're like so tongue tied. They've been like this for six years We've already had six years behind them. We don't have to rush right this second. We want to make sure that everybody is prepared going into this. And um, even from, you know, talking, like really spending a lot of time about what your post-operative pain management strategy, you know, making sure you have all this together so there's no surprises for them and there's no calls for you, for, you know, where everybody is all flustered, especially when you first start doing it because, you're second guessing yourself anyway, you know? And so the more prepared, because we all second guess ourselves, right? But the more prepared you are, the less um, sort of things in the gray area. So just really sticking to your guns about what we know about the importance of prep work. And if you've usually done the prep work, then the post work, they're already set up for it. Does that help a little? Definitely, that makes so much sense. Thank you so much, Dr. Van. Oh, I'd love to come back. I'd love to, uh, I'll, um, I'd be happy to show that um, presentation that I'm giving because I'm I actually know. really like it. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about appliances or show a little bit more of the younger kids because I have some really fun young kids that I'm working with who are just, it's just, guys, there's nothing more fun than treating three or four-year-olds. There's oh, now, I know there's some general dentists that do adults who are probably <laughs> like cringing and I feel the same way about you. Like I couldn't treat an adult airway patient for any, like I couldn't, like I'm so amazed about what you guys do. But if you like kids at all, it's really worth sort of getting out of your comfort zone and realizing that they are in so many ways, so much easier to get through this than an adult and so quickly rewarding. They can do it, they love it. I will take a three-year-old over an eight, nine, 10 year old any day. Fantastic. Although I like uh, those kids too. <laughs> yes, if you guys would like to have Dr. Ballinger back, please give us some little hearts on Facebook and share this live. Uh, I'm going to leave it open for about 24 hours. If you guys- yeah, So um, yeah, I'm a little bit in a silent lurker part because I haven't opened my new, new office yet, but you can find me on um, uh, my office email. Should I put it in the chat? Yes. Okay. And I'll do it over here. Okay, I'll so share it on admin, our, our Facebook group. Okay, so it's admin at nurture grow dentist. Wait, I spelled it wrong, dot com. I do have a Facebook, Nurture Grow Dentist.com. And I think those on Facebook, I think it's good to grow. Perfect. And I think it's the Nurture Phrenectomy Center. I do have an Instagram. One of my, you know, one of my team members, of course, runs this for me because I'm like right in that age <laughs> gap where like I get it, but I don't get it. Yes, and I'll make sure that I'll put on our social media. I have tagged you guys uh, on our um, Instagram but I will share on. Yeah, will you please? Because like, yeah, I saw you getting set up on the computer and it was like, oh my gosh, I don't know how you, I'm definitely getting older. Like I can't keep up. So I need, 
I need um, somebody to help me with it, but I'm out there. We need okay. you to focus on the Frenactive right. Family you Expansion. We'll right. take care of social media for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, I'd love to come back. I think you guys are amazing or not. I just am so proud and impressed of you. Thank you for all you do. And thank you for my cup. I love it. You made my day. <laughs> thank you so much. Next week, guys, on Tuesday, we have Dr. Johal. We're so excited to hear from her. And on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, I think, uh, Angela and I are going to be at the AAPMD. We're super excited. Dr. Ballinger will be there. Be there. <laughs> and we're going to be going live from there. So, awesome. um, you know, stay tuned. Check our Instagram. Um, we're going to have live videos here and there uh, for you guys to see what's going on at the AAPMD and who are we meeting in the halls and who are we stopping to ask questions. Oh my gosh, you're, like, you're like a real life talk show host. I love it. <laughs> In the airway. <laughs> but it's really cool. Don't talk to me about anything else, but if you're talking about- I know, I'm like that too. We know um, what we know. And <laughs> okay. all right, nice to meet all of you. Anyways, have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank y'all so much. We'll see y'all later. Bye-bye.